where are we now? Well, um, we just talked about Hamiltonian paths slash cycles, which is a path through an overlap graph in which you go through each node once and only once. If it's a path, you start and finish at a different place. If it's a cycle, you start and finish at the same place. How do you use this in genome assembly? Well, you take your short read data, you break them up into k-mers, and then you connect, you make the k-mers the nodes. They connect together by edges only if they overlap, if they overlap between the suffix of one and the prefix of the other, okay? And if you can do all of that and you can find a path or a cycle through, then you can stack those things up and presto, there's your longer sequence built out of shorter reads. And this, this has worked. It definitely works, worked. But like I was saying earlier, it's uh, those overlap only based approaches, um, these Hamiltonian approaches as well, they're very time consuming and they are very computationally demanding. And in fact, um, Hamiltonian paths or cycles belong to a special category of computing science problems called NP-complete problems. Um, and that, you know, what an NP-complete problem means is, uh, is a big topic that's beyond the scope of this class, but a simple way of thinking about NP-complete problems is that they're problems for which no efficient solution algorithm has been found. Um, so they, they are very difficult problems. If you can figure out how to solve that problem, you can win a million dollar prize in mathematics. It's being awarded by forget what foundation. Um, these are considered millennium problems. So big genomes and the complexity um, from repetitive sequences make um, application of this approach, which is inherently challenging in and of its own because it's an NP complete problem, really difficult. So, so what? So what do we do now? We've still got this data and we want to use it. So we're going to travel to uh, the World War II time, right? Back in 1946 to another mathematician, Nicholas de Bruin. And Nicholas de Bruin invented something called de Bruin graph theory. And he did this because he was fascinated by theoretical math and he was really interested in being able to predict look, uh, the binary strings that were what is called k-universal. So how do you know if a binary string like this here is k-universal? Well, k can be any number, right? So let's make k three universal. And if, if you're looking at binary code, to be three universal means that you have to be, you have to have a string that contains each of the possible three position combinations of zero or one that are unique, right? This is unique, this is unique, this is unique, and so on. Two to the three, all right? So this binary string has all of these. And you can look at that and you can just intuit that um, pretty quickly. But imagine if that binary string was like, I don't know, a thousand uh, digits long, then how do you know quickly if it's K universal? It's like a really hard problem. It's a theoretical math problem and Nicholas de Bruin was interested in it. So he approached it using overlap theory and Hamiltonian path approaches. Too difficult, not solvable. solvable. Then he came up with the idea that he could apply Eulerian theory. So what, what he came up with is first he took um, the sub, he took substrings, right? And he broke out, so substrings are like strings within the larger string, right? Here we've got substrings that are three digits long, right? Sorry, sorry, correct me there. Here it's four digits long. He started off by focusing on the edges, and that was the genius of de Bruin's approach, right? He made the substrings, not the nodes, but the edges, okay? So, 0011 is a substring from a larger number. 
So is this 1011, right? And this 0110. He focused it on he focused on the edges. And he said, okay, I can put together a string from substrings if I can find, if I can graph it, and if I can find an Eulerian path that goes through each edge once and only once. And the Eulerian path here is shown in blue numbers, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And if you connect together these numbers based on their areas of overlap, the nodes are defined by the overlaps, okay? Then you can find a larger string that is so-called k-universal. And de Bruin was just interested in that. He was just interested in this binary code string theory, right? And this is back in the 40s. Like, this is like we haven't even invented Sanger sequencing, right? So you might be thinking, what does this have to do with DNA sequencing? Well, the genius here is that these really smart uh, computational scientists, Pesner, Tang, and Waterman, remembered de Bruin graphs when they were trying to figure out how to come up with a better way to assemble genome data in the late 1990s. So we see this explosion of sequence data as people race to get the human genome published, right? This is a race. This is like a moonshot. Remember, I told you that, right? So we're seeing all of this data coming, flying out of these Sanger sequences, and then importantly, these innovations in next generation sequence data or sequencing technology, which gives us these huge data sets of short read tech, which really complicates the genome assembly problem, making just assembly by overlap and Hamiltonian path pretty much impossible. So they are like, ha, huh, how can we do this? And they're like, okay, let's look at math theory. And they look back at Euler's approach, right? And they apply it and they publish it. And this is the link to the paper that they published. It came out in 2001. And as soon as that came out, sequence assembling software started to utilize not Hamiltonian paths, but Euler, Eulerian paths in order to solve the problems of genome assembly. So here's the same data that I showed you earlier. I'm just busting it out a little bit differently and kind of cannibalizing the figure in the paper that was linked to the previous slide. And this is showing the Eulerian path approach. So the difference here and in the earlier figure, we're still starting with the same chromosome, okay? And we still have the same short reads. I just drew them again and they're not pretty colors, right? You take those short reads and you still bust them out into the same camers, all right? You take those camers and those camers are going to be used to build what's called the de Bruin graph. And the de Bruin graph is different because the de Bruin graph has nodes that are made out of the prefixes or the suffixes. So here's a prefix, here's a suffix. When I put these two together, the T's overlap, and the actual camer in this case is the edge. It's ATG. Okay? And this goes to this. And how do I know that? Because the Kamer ATG is actually in the data set. I can refer to the data set for that, right? I put TG as the prefix here, right? And GG as the prefix here. TG, GG, they overlap at the center D or center G, and the actual edge or Kamer is labeled TGG. They go together and that's the directionality of it, right? So if I if I follow I can find an Eulerian path through this data set, right? All the way here and it's numbered. And I can take the edge identities and I can stack them up. And once I stack them up, it's super easy to regenerate the sequence, right? And it's hopefully gonna be a lot like the original sequences. This is might seem trivial, but it is fundamentally different from those Hamiltonian paths where the nodes are the actual kamer and the edges are the prefixes or suffixes. Okay, Here in an Eulerian approach, this which is applied to create de Bruin graphs, the nodes are the prefixes or the suffixes of the kamers that come out of the read data. 
And in connecting them together, you can assemble pretty complex data sets much more easily because finding Hamilton or finding Eulerian paths or cycles is not an NP complete problem. It is a solvable problem. Euler figured that out. Okay, so why is this better? De Bruin graphing approaches, which use Eulerian paths or cycles, are not NP complete problems. They are solvable even with large complex data sets. And this is something that we, you know, was published in 2001 by Pevsner and colleagues. And since then, those De Bruin graphing approaches have been built into the majority, I would say, of genome assemblers, and especially very popular ones like the one that we will use in class, which is called SPADES for St. Petersburg Genome Assembler. Um, that SPADES paper is here, and um, you guys are going to be running SPADES on your data sets, and the link to the directions for using SPADES are in this slideshow and also on the README file. So that concludes this introduction to um, genome assembly at an overview level, and I look forward to seeing you guys in class.